My guest today is Dobie Carroll, and Dobie serves as the director of bands at North County High School in Bonterre, Missouri, where he has been since 2014. He is fortunate to work with a team of directors to oversee a 6-12 through 12 band program of about 400 students, as well as a high school guitar program that was implemented in 2018. The North County bands take pride in a well-balanced history of success in the areas of concert, marching, and jazz. And since Dobie's arrival, the extremely rich history of jazz at North County has been expanded to add a second high school jazz band into the curriculum. The North County Jazz Ensemble received the honor of performing for the first time at MMEA in 2017. North County is fortunate to host a variety of annual jazz and concert band clinics and performance events through the year. Outside of his own classroom, Dobie enjoys serving as an active clinician and judge to band programs and festivals around the state. Dobie is well known for his leadership development that he uses with his students and student leaders. And we talk about that amongst a variety of other things. So let's dive into it. So during a previous podcast, I often ask my guests who they'd like to hear interviewed. And, and your name was mentioned. And, and in particular, that person was very interested in student leadership and how you develop student leadership. And I uh, think they you know, were just kind of enamored with your approach to that. And as I mentioned it to you, you mentioned that, uh, yes, indeed, that is something that you intentionally work on, but also more specifically program management in general was actually something that you've spent quite a bit of time on. So kind of talk to us a little bit about what your thoughts are on that and, and what are some of the things you do that you think help your program North County to be successful? That's a, it's a big area to start out with. Just in general, I'll take a step back to rephrase the question, someone came into our program a few years ago to work with my bands and he, he spent the whole day and worked with our concert bands. It was great. And then our jazz bands came up and he just kind of admittedly said, this is not my area of expertise. Happy to hear it. Sounds good, but I don't really have anything to offer. So let me ask you questions about your group or about your program. And the big question was he wanted to ask my top jazz band, what makes your program different? And it's almost like an automated response sometimes, but at the same time, I take comfort in knowing that my kids know the focus of our program is developing a family atmosphere. That was part of a, a mission statement creation that took three years with our student leadership team. So we went over the three points that day, our mission statement. We have a compass that accompanies the mission statement, just some points we like to highlight on a regular basis, have them posted in the band room. And something we do that I, I've never heard anyone else doing is do a seven week leadership character study every January and February with my high school bands. And we call it Wooden Wednesday. And it's based off of John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. There's one set. So every four years I introduce them to, to John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. And everything else is just random things I run into and I feel like my kids will be better humans by me sharing this information with them. Some of them are funny. Some of them are just, you know, little tidbits. Some of them take the entire class. Some of them take 15 minutes. And early on in my career, I would have laughed at the idea that this guy would take out an entire class period to talk about these character things when we could be getting all of these things done. I'm very efficiency motivated, but there's nothing in the world that would change my mind from doing that now, seeing the way it's impacted our program. And then that study kind of boosts into our leadership application process. My kids never seem to catch on, but the day their final reflection is due from the Wooden Wednesday, the leadership application goes live like one minute later. So I want to see how their reflections are through this whole character study. And then we can talk about, are you in a place where you're willing to serve our program? And are you a good fit for what we need here for the service portion? Some of them are like typical leadership lessons. Um, the random book excerpts like Rain Wilson wrote a book called The Bassoon King. And he has this section in there called 10 things I know for sure. And it's just heartfelt, like things that he, uh, he talks about, he knows to be true. And that's a phrase I use in our program a lot, whether we're counting complicated rhythms or I have a, a high school girl in my office crying about ridiculousness. What do you know to be true? Not what do you feel, but what do you know to be true? And then some of the other ones are uh, much more out in right field. Like we have a lesson in this set on prepping for finance for after high school, because I feel like I was very poorly prepared for that. And I, I don't want to see my students make the same decisions that end up with them being impacted by student loans that are unnecessary. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, the first yes. lesson of this coming set is from the TV show, Parks and Rec, Johnny Karate's five karate moves to success, <laughs> but just try to find fun things to get their attention, but it might stick. Yeah. <clears throat> you had mentioned that early on, you would have not thought you would spend this kind of time on this type of thing. You would have rather have had rehearsal time. But now that you're spending this time developing leadership and being intentional and actually having like kind of coursework for it, you're noticing an impact in your program. What are the things that you're seeing? What's the payoff for doing all this? The general atmosphere of the program, the students' willingness to put back into the program and not just with their instrument, but whatever. I, I have students that would do anything in the world that I ask them to do for our program. Sometimes those things involve, you know, a little bit of notice, like, Hey, we need some people to do this on January 26th. And it's going to take a couple hours. Do we have anybody that can volunteer for that? Send out a, a sign up genius and it, it fills up. I, I don't have problems finding willing kids because they're so invested in what we do and they believe in serving each other in the program that's bringing younger generations up. It's, it's pretty incredible once you, uh, get it going to sit back and watch it work. Mm -hmm. What have been some of your favorite leadership lessons that you feel like has had the biggest impact on students? Every year uh, we do a summer leadership camp before marching camp starts. I ask them the question, what has impacted them the most? And usually there's almost always a couple of kids who shout out the Fred factor, a book by Mark Sanborn. I just did a really quick run through of the concept of the book, which that's about a mailman who was dedicating his life to exceptional customer service as a mailman. But we, we take those principles and see how we can go above and beyond in service to others. And then uh, there's this page in the book. I don't even remember what they call it, but I just call it the cycle of Fred. When you are more Fred like you attract other people that are Fred like, and then everyone wants to, to kind of be more like that. So basically I tell them that everything in life, including this rehearsal is going to be cyclical. If you create this attitude for this rehearsal, it's going to impact the person beside you. They're going to want to do better. That person doing better is going to make you want to do better and it's going to whirlwind into something great. Same can be true. We have a phrase that we don't like to refer to very often in marching rehearsals is the cycle of suck. Every once in a while, you know, it's not going great and attitudes start to enter the field and then things start going poorly and then directors get frustrated and when directors get frustrated, kids' attitudes, you know, aren't great. So it just keeps spinning downward. So every once in a while, when we recognize that, uh, that whirlpool effect, we just stop rehearsal. Um, whether it's a quick conversation or just doing something totally unrelated and goofy for five minutes, we just realize that we've hit a wall until we can change some type of direction out of that cycle. Mm -hmm. We all see that even in our personal lives or, uh, sure. even other groups and stuff we participate in that sometimes you just get us sort of stuck in this goofy loop or this, the suck loop or whatever. It, and there's a. Creates right. a feedback loop, the kind of like a conversation I have with Rob Babel about, you know, setting up these feedback loops. And sometimes you get one, a negative one and it just keeps building on itself and you have to sort of stop that, take a break, and then you can re-divert and then try to build a positive one. There was one, uh, section of that cycle of Fred that I forgot to mention, and it's attracting other people who are Fred. And so not just building each other up, but attracting other people who would like to be a part of a culture like that. Right. And that's a big part of recruiting future student leaders and uh, keeping that course in our program going. So how much of your leadership content and development is aimed at the entire program, like where everyone participates in it? And how much of that is set aside for just your designated student leadership? The, the wooden Wednesday, the seven week thing is for everybody. It's uh, it's part of the class. The leadership team meets for two and a half days in the summer. And most of that is logistical teaching 17 year olds, how to appropriately speak to their peers in a way that's going to get a positive response in all scenarios that they're going to encounter, like with our, in most of it's marching based, we start every rehearsal with a sectional and part of it is logistical. Uh, it's easier for us to take attendance and be productive in sectionals across the field. So we do it that way, but if there's 
a teenager that is not great at communicating positively to their section that puts a negative spin on rehearsal before we even get started. So things like that were very detail oriented. Kids know what part of the band bleachers they're going to sit in, where their water bottle goes on the field, all of that stuff before they ever get there. We set up some goofy stuff like uh, band Olympics that we throw into band camp to take the edge off a little bit. But almost all of that leadership camp is just planning. Then the things throughout the rest of the marching season, it's mostly information flow. Like we have a student checkout procedure at the end of every event and, you know, student leaders keep track of, is everybody in your section here on time? And did they do everything they need to do? They put all their stuff away and just that kind of simple stuff. But that kind of simple stuff that they can do so much faster than I can do for an entire band. Um, what are some of those? Tell me more about the kids. You're sort of just like, like, you know, that kind of stuff. But I, I don't know that I hear a lot of programs doing that. So give me a few more examples of the type of things those student leaders are handling for you. You mentioned oh, attendance, which is everything. a great one. <laughs> I, I just had a conversation with folks where the assistant director is counting 130 band kids. So I, I know there's a lot of people that are not doing that. So attendance is one. What, so what other stuff? General before specific, basically I approach every problem with the response of is there a way we can make this better? Whether it's looking around the room or, you know, evaluating a process, just anything that we can do with the people that we have to make it run smoother and make our day better. Um, I had a student through this entire marching season. They got to school before I did every day this year and made me a cup of coffee before I showed up. And I never knew who it was until the season was over. I finally asked, like, I never caught them. Who was it? And they told me. So at our uh, band banquet, I gave them the award of best cup of coffee. But that student's mentality was, he's not really much of a morning person. So uh, maybe if I come in and make his coffee for him, our rehearsal is probably going to go smoother. It's just going to be a, a better start to our day. And, and Simple things like that, students taking initiative, and that that's a ridiculous one. Like, that's never something I'm going to be like, all right, who's got this down? Who has to make my coffee this year? Right. We have uh, next to the light switch in the band room, there's a piece of paper hanging, and it's the EOD, BOD checklist, end of day and beginning of day. So we talk about in this leadership study stuff, every once in a while it will come up, my favorite question is how can I help? There's always something to be done around the band program. Sometimes I don't have enough time to explain that thing to a kid who we refer to it as a tool belt, who has fewer tools in their belt. But I always love when kids are looking for ways that they can help with simple things. The EOD, end of day checklist, <clears throat> simplifies that so much. There's a list of everything that needs to be done at the end of the day, every amp that needs to be checked to make sure it's turned off, Every, uh, room door that needs to be open or closed, every light that needs to be on or off, just a simple checklist of what needs to happen before we close down the band room today. So once I had all of these very young high school students asking me, how can I help? How can I be more helpful? It just turned into really quickly, like, have you checked the EOD list? No, I'll do that. And then after that, I didn't have to answer the same question as much. Right. So, all about saving my own time, all about getting things done as efficiently as possible. I, I like to create scenarios where kids can figure it out on their own and show other kids how to do it, as opposed to me being responsible for all information. The tool belt that I was talking about, that's also a document for us. And the, the tools are just referring to what capabilities do you have within our program? So our leadership team two, three years ago created the tool belt document and like the first item I think on the tool belt document is how to set up the marching sound cart, like how to attach the speakers and run the amps and run the wires and all that stuff. And it may seem like something simple, but I had one kid who did it for three or four years and then he graduated and then it was, looked like it was going to be me setting it all up. And so I called that kid and I said, Hey, get back here. <laughs> you need to show somebody how to do this before you go off to college. We have a very specific music library filing process. That's a tool in the tool belt. Once a kid gets approved to work with the music library, they can claim that as part of their tool belt and then they can help out with that stuff. Just tons of little things that may seem like they're small, but rarely if I'm standing in front of the band and need something, 
do I not have at least a couple of kids who know how to do that something? These individual tools are, it's almost like these are like little mini certifications, right? Like someone's being taught this and then, and it's being certified. And is that all being tracked? Not really. Um, it's just kind of informal. It, mostly informal, but some of the things like with the music libraries, typically I could potentially be an expensive stick that got mishandled. So I ask someone to supervise the first time, second time someone's working within the music library because if they mess something up, again, it's an expensive mistake that we don't really necessarily need. Right. With like the, the sound cart stuff, it's going to be really obvious to track if it is adequate or not. Like, did you do it? Does it work? Right. Did the speaker fall off? All right. You're good. I love that we, we have, you know, in retail, of course, we have many of these same types of uh, processes and procedures and we have opening checklists and closing checklists. And you're right. Like having all that kind of document, it helps to ensure that it gets done, creates clarity about what needs to be done. And also if it's written, it's real. And it allows you then to be able to delegate it more easily when you have defined tasks like that. So I love that idea. It's, it's almost like a lean process of improvement where you're just trying to find a little bit every day to make it just that much easier. And you know, if you gosh, if just, if every day, if you can make your program 1% more efficient, then, uh, it takes, I think the math is it takes something like 72 days to have a hundred percent improvement because of, uh, compounding interest. So all, you know, just takes the, just a little bit each day over time just has uh, drastic results. What about other general thoughts on just like program management? So you do a lot through st students, but you'd mentioned that you'd actually like even, even gone back to get some additional education on like in trying to understand better how you're managing your program. Talk to me a little bit more about that. So in, I think it was 2007 or eight, I started my master's degree. I went back to school in Evangel University where I got my undergrad and pursued a master's in educational leadership. I knew that would give me the certification I needed if I ever wanted to become a principal, but I really didn't understand how closely some of the coursework paralleled the MBA program at Evangel. And some of the, like some of the text was even the same. Some of our, our course books were just general leadership books. One that stood out to me that the first place I found it was a uh, good to great by Jim Collins. I discovered that book in the, the coursework of that master's program. So the, the big thing I think that program did was it just kind of picked me up and shifted me over to the side and gave me a different perspective about how to look at everything. Um, when something is broken, how to evaluate it effectively. And it's super business-like more than most things that are education, but it's just a healthy way to look for improvement. We had classes that were geared toward like how to handle HR things like hiring and firing of staff. And I still use those principles in not only hiring staff, but also looking for student leaders to run parts of my program. Managing data, I had a big revelation day probably three or four years ago. I looked around in my office and there were nine people in there ready to start a marching rehearsal. Nine like college kids and other staff members, most of them were temporary people that we just bring in for you know a week during the summer. And that day I realized there's a lot of ways where my job is more like running a retail organization than it is directing a band because I had to schedule myself time that week out of rehearsal just so I could make sure all of these nine people had something to do and had clear instruction on what the expectation is. Right. I was the only one that could do that. And if I didn't, I would have very qualified people sitting in the back of the room with nothing to do. And I think the overall effect is higher if I take myself out of the rehearsal and give all of these people something productive to do. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's something that's a part of our daily or weekly exercise, not just, not just that marching rehearsal or the extreme version. We have a weekly plan across our three directors and for the high school version, I plan out every thing, every objective that every director for like the 
uh, starting next week or the week after that, whenever it is, the symphonic band, this director is going to pull out the percussion section and work on ensembles. This director is going to be on the podium that day. I've never been the, like, I'm the only one who gets to be on the podium guy because I, I definitely see the benefits of every person we have. Is that it, something it, that all of us have different streets? Is that something that you're creating and then like distributing, or is that something that those people are also participating in that process and saying like, Hey, I'd like to be a you know, be on the podium for this piece or this time or this tune. I take the responsibility to create it, but they are a hundred percent, uh, hoping to, to give input for that. The one thing I tell them is I plan a week in advance. So if we have a rehearsal that reveals a problem within one piece of music or within one concept of any kind, that's a great discovery. We can put it into the plan for next week, but this week is probably not going to be altered. And the same goes for in the middle of rehearsal. If there's these three objective points for that rehearsal, I would like you to make sure that you get through those three points instead of we got to the first one and realized there's this major catastrophe at letter B in the song. I was like, great, write that down. And then we can, you know, add that into the plan in the future. But for today, let's see if we can stick to the objectives as closely as possible. And there are a lot of days where, you know, we can have directors hang around. One of our directors is a fantastic flute player. So she is very passionate about flute pedagogy and she wants to, uh, you know, pull out the flute section, work on fundamentals and basics and just kind of redirect some things. So I'll, I'll give her days here and here every once in a while to, to do those things. Mm -hmm. Just whenever we can work it. As far as the transparency, that document is publicly visible. And we post it to every Google classroom for every one of my classes, because it shows what every one of my classes are going to be doing every hour of every day in the coming week. And if a kid misses a day, they know what they missed. My higher level students, they sometimes are also the students who are in multiple activities and playing sports and have jobs. And sometimes they want to know what to practice for the highest priority. And they can look at that plan and see, oh my gosh, we're playing that song that kind of stinks on Thursday. I should make sure I slot out some time on Wednesday to uh, go over that part. So, you know, our rehearsal is of higher quality. Mm -hmm. Have you always been this sort of meticulous and disciplined or is this a <laughs> learned behavior? Because it's pretty, I mean, that is pretty meticulous of planning your week. It's great. I mean, it's, it's really, really fantastic, but I, you know, it's. I think that's something that may come easier to some people than others, but how about you? Oh, was it sorry? The, the laughter and response, but the, the short answer is absolutely not. I have not always been this way for anyone who knew me growing up or even through college, um, listening to some of these things, their, their jaws may be dropping if they, they hadn't been around me in the last several years. I, I still remember the, the first time my high school band director heard one of my groups he just looked confused. <laughs> it's like, I don't mean to be rude, but like, I didn't see that one coming. And <laughs> I, I was a, let's just call it mediocre. I was a mediocre student in high school. I didn't try at anything I didn't want to. That got me through high school just fine. So I carried that mentality through college and I, I put the minimal effort into things unless they excited me. And then. All of a sudden I woke up one day and I was in a classroom with kids looking at me and just thought, oh crap, I've got to figure this stuff out. And at that point it became very real to me and I became extremely motivated and I didn't really know how to do everything, but I knew the, the short answer was someone does, and I'm going to find that someone and I'm going to figure it out. And I have, I've had an excellent variety of mentors through my career, whether it's taking time to just go sit in someone's classroom or taking someone out to lunch and just picking their brain and asking all the questions I could think of. I, and then constantly having that attitude of, all right, this did not go so well. Mm -hmm. How can I make it better in the future? Yeah. And that's, that process has gotten much more specific. And then my second year of teaching, I believe I started my master's program and then that drive with all of that detail and guidance from those professors just kind of made everything click. And then the, the next step of that was I started developing all of my own leadership stuff, things to hang on the wall, lessons to go over with band kids around 2000, 
nine ish. And my middle school principal at the time, I named Walt Belcher, just kind of poked his head in every now and again. He was also my mentor uh, because he taught similar courses through another university. So he, he would check up on me every now and again, just to see how the, the educational leadership stuff was going. And he uh, just kind of poked his head in one day and said, Hey, this stuff's really neat. Have you ever heard of John Wooden? It's like, no, he, he's a basketball coach. And this guy was, you know, former college basketball coach. So like, oh, of course he is. I'm sure he's great. He played basketball, whatever. And he stopped by another day that week and dropped off the book, Wooden on Leadership. And I opened it up and started reading and got so angry. It's like, why didn't I find this sooner? Because this guy takes every single thought I've ever had in my life about leading people and says it better and more clearly in a way that's easier to understand. Ah, I wish, I don't know. Every, every person in this world should be exposed to John Wooden and just in general, John Wooden, but his, his leadership pyramid is, it's fantastic. And not just the pyramid, but his approach to it and how he chose to, to work with the humans that he was surrounded with and became the, and he was the one that said, you know, the, the success of his basketball team was so secondary to the humans he worked with. All of those things resonated so deeply in everything I was trying to do with that job that I was like lighter fluid on, on everything that had already been started. I was already motivated. I had excellent professors at Evangel who were, who were teaching me what to do with all this energy that I'd never tried before. Like, oh, you're trying. That's neat. It's like, yeah, I've never done it before. <laughs> this is a new thing for me. I'm, I'm still experimenting with it. <laughs> yep. Uh, and like I said, even through college, it was the professors. They knew that I wasn't trying very hard. I'll just put it that way. Uh, <laughs> when I was fortunate to have a group play at MMEA in 2017. And I remember one of my college professors coming up to me and just the look of utter shock. Like how on earth did. It's like, it, it's all good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right. Right. Well, obviously the light came on, you know, it came on at, at least it came on at some point. And, uh, and then from then on you were, you were lit up. Yeah. I, I think that honestly makes me a better teacher too. I struggled like through everything I struggled. So when I have a kid that has those same struggles, I'm, I'm not, I've never been the, the principal trumpet player for anything. I get your struggles. I've been there. This is how I approached it when I was at this stage in my playing career. And I think it'll help you too. And I think I can relate to that low to mid-level kid better. And, you know, I'm at a point in my career now where it, the, the upper level players, those are easy to guide. They're self-motivated. You just tell them what to do. And if I can't answer it, I can find the answer. Right. Yeah. With those folks, you just, you, you point them in the right direction and sort of get out of the way, right? Yep. Give them insights and some resources and, and they're motivated. They'll handle it, but it's motivating. The unmotivated is where the real, the real magic lies. Absolutely. We had mentioned when we were just kind of chatting before we got started that, you know, because of all of this, uh, knowledge that you have and, and that you've gained and, and learned and implemented on managing your program more efficiently and, and developing your student leaders, that it's enabled you to just you know, put a fraction of the time into the work as, uh, as anyone else does that you just have a lot of time off and, and uh, get to kick back and keep things relaxed and easy. Oh, wait, no, it's the opposite. And you <laughs> actually end up <laughs> trying to just do more and more and working yourself to the bone, <laughs> even though you have <laughs> all these great student leaders around you, which is how a lot of us are wired, you know, we, we have uh, technology that makes us more efficient. And what do we do? Do we work less? No, we work more and get more done. Let's talk about some of the challenges of that. And I, I, you know, this will be a, a, a quintessential preaching to the choir, I think for many people who, who are going to be listening to this podcast, but what is it that makes you feel so compelled to do all these extra things that take all this extra non-contracted time? Is it your administration that makes you do it? Is it your parents that make you do it? Is it your students or is it your ego? What is it that, that makes that? Well, it's a hundred percent me. No one else is making me do all this stuff. Now it's getting an idea in the middle of the night 
rolling over and grabbing my phone and making a note. So I say, hey, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll look at that tomorrow. And then just spending time on my Christmas break, working on an idea I had that I think is probably going to make our jazz improv better in the future. And I had another one that was working on some middle school percussion stuff. Just, I never have this much downtime to sit and sometimes when I do nothing for just a day, you know, it's like your brain gets the ability to breathe and all the ideas that are in there just, Hey, wouldn't that be cool? Right. That's the version now. And basically the, the now version is still not to the sound arrogant, but I, I know I'm competent at what I do. And if I'm going to put time in, I'm going to most of the time create something that's successful and can maybe even help other people in other directors. Like I have some resources that I've came up with that other people find useful. How I introduce rudiments to my middle school percussionists. There's some people around the country that use that little warm up that I made one Christmas break when I had some time. That's the answer now is I can be productive. So it, it feels good. Like if I'm sitting here, why not do the thing that I know I'm good at? Early on in my career, it was much more personal crippling fear of not being good enough. I went to high school where I teach high school. There is a tradition of excellence that is decades old. And when I took over that program, there are choices that I made and approaches that I took that were 100% a reflection of, I am scared to death. This program is going to lose quality and the finger is going to be pointed back at me. Right. So I will work all day, every day to make sure that is not an option. Probably took me three or four years to get through that mentality. And I, the end result was like all of the, the things, like the performances were good, but those kids didn't get the best version of me that I think my kids are getting something closer to that now. Uh, I. I don't, you can't like redo being young and ignorant, but I, I wish I could have offered this version of me to the kids that came through the program in the first three years I was there. Well, that to anyone who's, you know, conscientious and considerate and, and, and works to on self-improvement, that's just inevitable. I mean, I feel much the same way. I'm 47. I've been, I've been, it's, I'm well, actually getting ready to just finish up my 20th year. Jan January uh, 2nd was when I started. So this January 2nd will be my 20th year at Springfield Music. And yeah, man, uh, it's light and day difference between how I manage people and things now than what I did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I was in my late 20s for crying out loud. Like I didn't even know what I didn't know. And there were some things then that may be even better than what I am now. Like there was certainly a, a, you know, kind of an energy and enthusiasm. I often feel like even though it wasn't accurate, there was this benefit of having this sort of ignorance on reality and how things work. And so, yeah, there's a bit of this like tilting at windmills and, you know, things, these things you set up in your mind that aren't actually true, but they energize you and you motivate you. So. You know, typical example would be, you know, thinking of your competitors and competition. Well, like we're good and they're bad, you know, like that, that kind of simple thinking, not just like, no, like we're just, everybody's trying to do, do what we do and we may do it in different ways, but it doesn't make them bad people because they're different or because they're your competitor. But when you're younger and you have that competitive mindset, so you often can think that way. And especially maybe from it's a generational thing or whatever. Uh, and then as you get older, that starts to change, but there's a certain energy that can come from that as well. But that energy can also be kind of destructive and caustic and it can really eat at you and tear away at you. But it, for in a short term, it can really drive you to be, you know, to be on a quest or on a, like a religious mission, you know, that you're here, I am doing this thing because like, I must save these people from whatever. And there's some energy to that, but certainly the, you end up in my case, managing and operating more out of like fear and a, and aggression and ego and less out of care and concern for other people. And then you do get to a point where you also just enjoy the challenge of trying to be better. 
and trying to make this thing better and, and, and be more efficient and to accomplish new tasks. And I always kind of felt in the, over the years that I was sort of driven to do this just because like, you know, I'm, I'm an employee and I'm being employed by an employer who has these expectations. But a couple of days ago, I was getting up and telling my, telling Belinda that I have to get up and go to work. And, you know, and of course today it's, we're having this conversation on Christmas Eve and I'm, I'm in one of the few people that's in the office today working and, and, you know, I was telling Belinda, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know why, I, you know, I, I do this because I was working till midnight last night and I've been up and at it today. And she's like, oh, I do. She's like, it's because you like it. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Like, it's a lot of work. It's kind of grinding. And she's like, well, I mean, you own the company. So like, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. Like if you're doing it now, it's because you like it. I'm like, huh? Yeah, I guess you're right. Like <laughs> maybe, maybe I do like it. I mean, I know, I know there's parts of it I like, but I think I just sort of like the, the grind. It's good to make stuff better. It does. And it feels good to be in the middle of it. And in my case, and maybe to your case, to some degree, but certainly in my case, I work with people that I've selected, you know, my day isn't actually in front of customers that much anymore. My day is mostly with the, my coworkers and sometimes with the directors and key vendors. But it, with all that is stuff that I feel like I've, I've chosen these people, you know, I've chosen my coworkers, I've chosen my vendors, even in large degree, I've chosen many of our customers. And so, yeah, I like being around these people. <laughs> these are people I've chosen to be around. Mm -hmm. And so. I enjoy it. Even if I'm doing something not enjoyable, I still enjoy that I get to do it with them. And, uh, so she's, I think she's right. I think she's right. And so I think you're probably in the same boat, but then unfortunately though, we can end up doing that where it takes over even maybe some of what, it, what might be better for us to do. I, I certainly, because I put so much time and energy and devotion into, into the music retail business and investing also in music educators, music education and doing things like this podcast, which is a totally free thing. I just, we don't even like, you know, there's no advertising on it or it's not you know, sponsored by whatever. It's just the thing we do to try to help others. I do all that often at, to, you know, at the exclusion of things like maybe my own personal health and fitness. And I know that you too have, you know, recently kind of run into that challenge and not that we know we don't have the solutions, obviously, cause we still struggle with it. But what are we going to do with ourselves, Doby? Like, <laughs> how are we going to get ourselves to have a little bit more balance so that we take care of ourselves so that we can be here to, to sustain our programs so and businesses? It's an excellent question that was asked to me again for the hundredth time last night. I was hanging out with some, some music teacher friends and just kind of jokingly repeated the same question. So what are you going to do about this now that you got really sick because you ran yourself down so far? Like. What are you gonna do for fun? And I just kind of blankly stare at the wall like I I don't. And then I usually revert to like I I used to play guitar for fun. I used to like biking a lot. I used to go fishing a lot. I used to play tennis a lot. And then I got this job and it consumed all of me. And it's it's tough to find that. And we were talking earlier about everything is cyclical. Mm -hmm. So. I am exhausted at the end of a school day, whatever time I get home and then I crash. And then because I spend, you know, that time totally crashed, it eventually just creates habits of eating poorly and not exercising and then, you know, getting more long-term tired and in worse shape. Yeah. Everything is cyclical and I don't know what the answers are, but definitely got to break some trends somewhere. And this is, I, I don't have an excuse at all. I have an incredible staff. I have amazing students that save me time and do all these things. And kind of like you were saying earlier, now I just find different stuff to work on because they're doing a good job with this. Yep. Totally. I work with, I work with the best team I've ever had. I don't have to work. I've had times where maybe I, you know, don't work as much and don't put as much time in and things run great. Some might say things run better. They probably, honestly, they probably run better when I'm not around because there's no one looking at it and th saying, I think we need to improve this process. And so in terms of just like operation, things are smoother when I'm not here because no one's trying to necessarily improve everything, which is what probably what I bring to the table. So yeah, I think we talk about frequently the, um, the true test of any process or organization is how it runs. 
in your absence. I was very sick last weekend and my, my top jazz band got an invitation to do an awesome concert with the Dave Dickey band. And it crushed me to think that like, I can't go, I, I can't get out of bed. I don't, I don't know what to do, but these kids can't miss this opportunity. And one of my assistants, Emily Reese just stepped up and said, I got this. And I saw a couple of clips on social media. I haven't got to talk to the kids about it yet because it was after the, the school break. And then I, I got a message from Dave saying, you know, everything went well. They were, they were there. They, they played well. Good job. I think that's yep. part of our job when you're at the top is, is leading the leaders and whether that's the the paid leaders or if it's the student leaders, but you know, your job is to, is to lead those folks and guide and train and uh, develop that cohesion. And, and that's a skill, you know, I think it's a skill for yeah. some people that comes more easily than others, but it's a skill. And if it's a skill, it's something that can be learned. That's, that's, if I had to point to a single point of focus for my year, it's been fostering our staff relationships. I, I went out to lunch with Linda Hook over the summer and just told her that I think I'm not in a midlife crisis, but I think I'm in a mid-career crisis. And it, it's not really a crisis and that's probably not a, the best way to describe it, but I feel like I've done most of the things in my job that I set out as goals. And even like I had a a list of music when I got the job, like, I want to play every one of these. And I did, and, you know, that one's simple. Like I'll, I'll find new music, I'll, I'll play them again. But some of those bigger goals of like what I want our program to look like, they're there and they're doing a great job. And it, it's not like I have to make any grand changes. So she just started asking me about the upcoming year and Emily Reese is now in her second year with me and she's a second year teacher and Abby Hilton is in her first year with me and I believe she's a fourth year teacher. And I just told her that like, I am putting all of this effort in to make sure these young ladies are extremely comfortable in our program and they feel at home and they have everything they need. And I don't, I don't want to go through bringing up new directors again in my career. If I don't have to, I want to foster those relationships to make sure they're, they're at home. And if they need anything inside or outside of our program, we're here. And Linda just kind of looked at me and well, Toby, it sounds like you found your point of focus for the year. Like, I don't know why you took me out to lunch, but. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll keep working on that. Uh, I definitely have other things, as we mentioned with the, uh, the personal side of not working, but that's organizational management. I, I think the future of the program that I'm so blessed to be a part of is going to be strong because of the relationships we have within our staff. I, I use this analogy all the time. It's something I certainly believe in and, um, uh, have experienced multiple times throughout my career, but so many things, things are kind of like a, a flywheel, depending on the value and difficulty of the project will determine the size and weight of this flywheel. And when you're trying to get something started, getting that flywheel moving takes an enormous amount of, of energy. And then eventually like it becomes easier to sustain a certain speed. And then at that point though, because you've got it moving, if you'd like to get it moving faster, doesn't take as much energy, but that's the time if you want to try to get that thing going faster. And in business and our in our programs, it's often that way where you know you you come into a, a program that maybe needs a refresh and needs an overhaul, the amount of time and effort and energy it's going to take to build that culture, to build that leadership, to build the, that quality takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort. And then you get it to a point and then you can either like stay at that level. And if you just want to maintain that level, then the amount of energy to maintain it is drastically less, or you keep applying energy so that you can raise it to a new level. I think in some cases, as we, it's easy for me to do that in the business because I enjoy it and I find it rewarding and I, I know I'm good at it. It's harder for me to start that process when it comes maybe to like my personal health and well being. And I think maybe the flywheel is going the wrong, it's going the wrong direction. So I first have to stop it from spinning in the wrong direction, which that takes a lot of work and you can hurt your hands. 
and then I got to get it going the right direction. And that's just like so much work. I, I don't, I, and it's not very exciting. And I don't know, like I would like to be healthy. I'd like to be, you know, more fit and thinner and stuff, but I guess I don't like it enough to actually do it. <laughs> Maybe I need to really try to get my mind around the idea of liking that more than what I, what I think. And then I get concerned if I do the time that I need that it's needed to do that, will it take away from what I'm able to do business wise or Will it actually add to it? Much like you Make just said at the start of our conversation yeah. of like, you know, the fact that you spend time on developing leadership has had tremendous, uh, impact on your program and has gotten your program to a quality that wouldn't be otherwise. It's my, my problem isn't even like, I don't, I don't think I would have to like it. I just need to find some routine to commit to. I'm, I'm very objective. If, if I set out a plan for myself, that's black and white and say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm that stubborn until some big thing falls in the way in August, unfortunately I got COVID and that wrecked my, my workout routine that I had finally set for uh, about four months. And that was the most consistent of my adult life. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I just didn't feel strong enough to do that for a long time. And then a bunch of other lame excuses. And then I had set on my calendar, I think last week was the day I was going to make my miraculous return to the gym. And I, I had a surprise reappearance of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever that laid me on my back. Yeah. I was in bed for another week. And I, I can only use those excuses for so long. I told one of my friends, I, I think I'm about out of excuses that are good. So, yep, sometime around, and it was last week. So I, I think next week I'd just going to have to start doing it again. Yeah. I don't have a good excuse anymore. I can get into it for a bit. It's hard to sustain it. Like you, it's kind of funny. I started working out and exercising and eating right in November of 19. So before the pandemic and I uh, had a gym membership and was using it regularly multiple times a week. I think I was working out about four times a week and then the pandemic hit and it just kind of killed all that motivation. And then over the summer, I kind of, my, my wife got me kind of back into trying to do stuff and we'd gotten in a habit of it. But then once back to school season starts, rental season starts, that just like makes it very difficult. And it's just hard, hard for me to get back into the things that I need to do. I don't know if this is helping anyone. <laughs> it's, if nothing else, it's certainly cathartic to talk about it. So if anyone's listening, A, know that you're not alone. The Misery Loves Company. And if you can help Doby or I, <laughs> this is our cry for help. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, this has been cool, man. Is there uh, anything else that, that you would like to cover today? The, the flywheel comment you made? I said earlier that it took about three years for our program to, to like seat itself and really take off. Well, once I started for students to buy into the processes. So around the fourth year, I felt like the, the proverbial flywheel was moving very well. The caution I would give to the flywheel is sometimes it moves so quickly that it can mow things over and you don't realize it. And so the fifth year at North County. I had one of my very trusted student leaders just come up to me and say, Mr. Carroll, I think fundamentally a lot of our younger students are overwhelmed and kind of weak. Like our program is strong and they walk into this and they just don't know what to do. So they just start faking it because we're, we're not spending as much time going over the basic things that we had to do when I was a freshman that made us this good. So I just see these upperclassmen that are, you know, they're running, they're going full speed all the time at a very high level. So throw the freshmen in there, go get them. Yeah, that's okay. Not maybe, maybe taking for granted a little bit, how much information they're actually processing versus holding on to for dear life. Yeah. We've got the merry-go-round spinning at a high speed and then you got someone trying yep. to jump on it. It was moving just, I, I needed to. To, to build some training wheels for the new kids each year. And sometimes I would forget about that. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You've certainly given me something to chew on this holiday season to think about what are the things like we, we have, you know, again, I, I, can't, I hate, I hate always bringing everything back to business. Cause I think an educator that listens to this might think like, you know, who cares, but 
I'm often just shocked about the lack of thought and care and development that I see sometimes in school, not band programs, but in uh, school systems and administration specifically. But, you know, we have processes that we have training documents and training processes and ways that we try to bring people up to speed quickly. And there's a lot of them and we're constantly working on them and trying to improve them and uh, trying to make sure they're relevant. And there's a lot of things that go that way. And, but you're right. I think, you know, even more, what, what do we need to do to get someone who's not currently on our merry-go-round uh, up to speed where they can safely climb aboard without breaking an arm or chipping a tooth. And uh, I wonder if I have all those pieces in play, I'll certainly give that some thought. And I certainly, I do think maybe there's programs out there and school districts out there that could think about that. Like, what do we need? What do we need process wise to successfully onboard new students into our program? What do we need that needs to be written so that it's real so that we can onboard new staff members, whether it's permanent staff members like directors or whether it's temporary staff members like marching technician techs and stuff like that. Like what materials do we need so that those people can come in and be productive and get up to speed quickly versus them running the risk of getting mowed over for the first couple of years of their career or whatever. <clears throat> That's very insightful. What are, so what did you do? What are some of the things you went to, to, to get those freshmen up to speed? We just had to take a step back and then kind of approach, like basically just don't look at the upperclassmen and look at them. And then if this were the band right now, how would you approach that rehearsal? And it, I mean, it changed everything Throw the upperclassmen back in there and you still have great examples of what to do and maybe have a conversation with them of, I need you guys to provide a little more patience because we need to break things down more for these guys. This is when the attitude of good leaders and students who understand the importance of the future of the program, like it was fine. It just right. needed a different approach. Yeah. You, you made the comment. Like you're afraid this is turning into a business podcast. I would say to any music educator, if you don't think you can benefit from learning a business mentality, you're fooling yourself. Like I said, the, the coursework in my master's degree was very closely paralleled with MBA stuff. And those were the classes that I found the most application to my job as a band director. I ended up never going into administration and I'm totally cool with that. I love my job. Just the idea of knowing how to process data, knowing how to work with people, knowing how to evaluate circumstances that don't get the response you want to the first time. Mm -hmm. the, just we're, we're dealing with typically mostly performance outcomes instead of just money. There's also money involved, but I, I don't listen to a, a, a ton of podcasts. Uh, my commute to work is like six minutes and I just never been a big habit for me, but the ones I do find myself leaning toward are usually business leadership podcasts. There's seems like there's frequently something I can take and apply. I, I don't even remember who it was, but, uh, one I listened to a couple months ago was talking about hiring and firing slowly, talking about, we're not going to say you're a part of this organization. And it was, again, in a business atmosphere until you've been given the chance to be introduced to all of these things uh, through a multiple step hiring process, and then have a trial period of do this, this, this probationary period, whatever, until they, you know, can say, all right, you're, you're an employee in this organization. All of those checkpoints gave them an opportunity to say, this isn't the best fit, not because you're not amazing, but because your strengths and your ideals don't necessarily line up with what we're trying to do. And I think you would be an awesome employee for this company over here, but, uh, your direction is different than ours. And yeah. then the same thing with, with firing slowly, which the, they mentioned shouldn't have to happen as often if you hired slowly, but sometimes you walk into scenarios. And just being very specific with objective checkpointed information. If we're talking about like student leadership, if I have a kid 
that's not communicating clearly, like we were talking about earlier, and not communicating in a positive way to peers. I just take it back to our leadership packet that we went over in July. And, you know, these are the expectations when we communicate with our peers in a sectional setting in a music rehearsal. Then how do you feel like you're doing with this? Me too. That's what I'm observing. So, um, just making sure that's a multiple step process because my brain runs quickly and I could really easily see another option of, yeah, you're just not going to do that anymore. I'm going to move on to this kid. It's, I can create so much harm quickly by thinking too quickly, move slowly, move intentionally. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I guess my, I would encourage you to at least move. <laughs> and, sure. you know, cause I do sometimes see where, you know, it, to use your last example, we may observe poor leadership from our students. I do sometimes observe where there's no movement, there's no correction. And I, I agree. We use the same philosophy here at Springfield Music. We try to hire slow and we try to try to fire slow. We try to, we try not to fire. We try to, to give enough clarity and communication where an employee recognizes that they're not being successful here and they need to move out. And ever since we've been, we've embraced that we'd fire far few people, but we also, that doesn't mean that we have a lot of people that need to go either. Like we've got a very, very strong team, but sometimes you'll see that turn into apathy where people just don't correct. And so you must correct it. I mean, at the sure. very least you, yeah, removing a student from a leadership position, but I do th agree with you that it'd be far better to, you know, work with them and have them, uh, have that conversation, like the way you outlined it but at least do something <laughs> sure. yeah, don't sure. allow that bad behavior to just continue yeah. yeah if you just let the behavior continue it's it's going to amplify throughout the program and you know there there's some quote that gets used everywhere like the the least behavior you allow is what will become the expectation or something like that so if, if you allow your students to treat each other poorly then that's that's the new thing oh we can yeah. do that that's how we can talk to each other that's not what i said yeah yeah, exactly. I guess if I had uh, one big thing to say to the music education, I would say that as this podcast has outlined some of the, the things that I'm very passionate about. I feel like I'm very good at walking into a rehearsal of mine or anyone else's and looking for ways that that atmosphere or that rehearsal could be more efficient and time could be saved and just simple little things. I love working with other programs and, you know, offering that insight. I, I, it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to do that since, you know, COVID and building shut down, but those are some of my most enjoyable days, just whether it's working with other kids or working with other student leadership groups, or just providing insight and observing a rehearsal and a program, happy to do that anywhere within a, a day's drive. I had someone comment to me several years ago, I'd really love to have you out and to do this, but I, I just, I don't have the budget for it. And I, I can't, you know, it's like, well, I have been known to work for as much as lunch as I've crossed the halfway point of my career. I feel it's my responsibility to start offering some of those insights, whether it be young directors or people who are just looking for other ways to look at things. I feel like I look at things differently than most music educators. So they're everybody probably has a dozen things that they do so much better than I do, but I might be good at this. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Shoot me an email. I'd love to uh, come out and check out band programs and give any insights or work with any kids you need. It's a lot of fun to be able to give back and to share that knowledge and wisdom that you've spent your career acquiring. You want to give it and other people to see it. I, I do that as well and totally, totally get it. And you also recognize it's a way for you to give back for people that have been there for you. You mentioned that you've, you know, many times have reached out for people to ask, you know, Hey, can we do lunch and asking for mentorship and guidance? So I love that you're willing to do that. What's your email address that everyone can reach you at? It's probably easier just to say northcountybands.com and then there's a director tab. Perfect. I would encourage anyone to take advantage of that for sure. Getting someone else's insight and a fresh perspective on your program, what you're doing can just reap huge dividends. So. That's generous that you'd offer it. They should certainly take you up on it.